And good morning. Looks like everything is up and running. Audio changed positions in my uh, OBS for some reason. It's uh, the indicator is at the bottom this time instead of the top, like every other time this week. Um, I don't know what to make of that, but I think things are working. It looks a little bit dark. Looks a little bit dark in my um, my preview window, but that might just be this display here as opposed to um, what's actually going out. Uh, so, I'll pause the preview, and let's go over and take, oh, you know what? I forgot to set up our chat. All right, this is much better. Let's go take a look at where we're at. So uh, we are uh, currently at keeping track of borrows at runtime with with ref cell. And uh, we have we have specifically um, been sort of playing around with ref cell as a way to give uh, give one one thing a mutable ownership and one thing an immutable ownership. And that's sort of like a very interesting thing. Uh, I I was able to chat with a um, with a Rust uh, with another Rust developer, but I forgot to ask them specifically about Rust Ref Cell and their uses for it. So I'm hoping to today um, maybe ask why uh, when when they would uh, be able to use that. Um, okay, so opening that up, keeping track of borrows at runtime with RefCell. Uh, let's just continue on. Uh, when creating immutable and mutable references, we use the ampersand and the at mute syntax, uh, respectively. With RefCell T, we use the borrow and borrow mute methods, which are part of the safe API that belongs to RefCell T. The borrow method returns the smart pointer type ref t, and borrow mute returns the smart pointer type ref mute t. Both types implement deref, so we can treat them like regular references. Uh, Miguel, good morning. Yeah, that would that would be awesome to hear like um, what what other developers like. And of course, if any other developers are listening, I would love to uh, to read what your suggestions are also. So please leave a comment, uh, let me know. The ref cell T keeps track of how many ref T and mute, ref, uh, mute T smart pointers are currently active. Every time we call borrow, the ref cell T increases its count of how many immutable borrows are active. When a ref T value goes out of scope, the count of immutable borrows goes down by one. Just like the compile time borrowing rules, Ref cell T lets us have many immutable borrows or one mutable borrow at any point in time. If we try to violate these rules, rather than getting a compiler error as we would with references, the implementation of Ref cell T will panic at runtime. Listing 15.23 shows a modification of the implementation of send in listing 15.22. We're deliberately trying to create two mutable borrows active for the same scope to illustrate that RefCellT prevents us from doing this at runtime. So write, uh, let mute one borrow, self sent messages, borrow mute, and then we immediately borrow it again into bar two borrows. So it's, it's not the same one, they're, they're different borrows, but they eventually, like they're pointing towards the same place in heap memory eventually. Uh, one borrow push, two borrow push, okay. We create a variable one borrow from the ref mute, smart pointer returned from borrow mute. Then we create another mutable borrow in the same way in the variable two borrow. This makes two mutable references in the same scope, which isn't allowed. When we run the test for our library, the code in listing 1523 will compile without any errors, but the test will fail. 
So yeah, it, it's just a, a standard panic, and the messages are we already borrowed. Notice that the code panicked with the message already borrowed, borrow mute error. This is how RefsLT handles violations of the borrowing rules at runtime. Catching borrowing errors at runtime rather than compile time means that you would find a mistake in your code later in a development process, and possibly not until your code was deployed to production. Also, your code would incur a small runtime performance penalty as a result of keeping track of the borrows at runtime rather than compile time. However, using RefsLT makes it possible to write a mock object that can modify itself to keep track of the messages it has seen while you're using it in a context where only immutable values are allowed. You can use RefsLT despite its trade-offs to get more functionality than regular references provide. It's like they're almost suggesting that the main usage of it is mocking in tests. It's sort of like an interesting idea as like using it using it in that way now lets you get around and not have to like open everything up um, just because you want to test the code also. Having multiple owners of mutable data by combining RCT and RefCellT. A common way to use RefCellT is in combination with RCT. Recall that RCT lets you have multiple owners of some data, but it only gives immutable access to that data. If you have an RCT that holds a RefCell, you can get a value that can have multiple owners and that you can mutate. For example, recall the cons list example in listing 1518 where we used RCT to allow multiple lists to share ownership of another list. Because RCT holds only immutable values, we can't change any of the values in the list once we've created them. Let's add in RefCellT to gain the ability to change the values in the list. Listing 1524 shows that by using a RefCellT in the cons definition, we can modify the values stored in all the lists. So, it's really interesting that they're doing, okay, an RC, but in RC, we're using RefCell I32. Which, I mean, I guess it, it feels really interesting because now we're getting the RC new, we're getting the RefCell new. We're able to clone. Value borrow mute plus equals 10. Value equals ref cell new ref cell new. So the value of this, we dereference it to get at the actual value. Then we can borrow mute because we have ref cell. So basically we can pretend that something is immutable when it's really mutable, but only kind of sort of immutable. You have to, um, you have to be very explicit in saying, I am about to mutate this. So it's like, it's, it's a very interesting and I have no idea when we'd want to do this. We create a value that is an instance of RC ref cell I32 and store it in a variable named value so we can access it directly later. Then we create a list in A with a cons variable that holds a value. We need to clone value so both A and value have ownership of the inner 5 value rather than transferring ownership from value to A or having A borrow from, from value. We wrap the list A in an RCT so when we create lists of B and C, they can both refer to A, which is what we did in listing 1518. After we've created the list in A, B, and C, we add 10 to the value in value. We do this by calling borrow mute on value, which uses the automatic dereferencing feature we discussed in chapter five. To, um, to dereference the RCT to the inner ref cell uh, value. The borrow mute method returns a ref mute 
smart pointer and we use the dereference operator on it and change the inner value. When we print a, b, and c, we can see that they all have the modified value of 15 rather than 5. Okay, so every single one of them now is 15. D after cons ref cell value 6, cons ref cell value 15. Interesting. Uh, this technique is pretty neat, but using, by using ref cell T, we have an outwardly immutable list value. But we can use the methods on ref cell T that provide access to its interior mutability so we can modify our data when we need to. The runtime checks of the borrowing rules protect us from data races, and it's sometimes worth trading a bit of speed for this flexibility in our data structures. The standard library has other types that provide interior mutability, such as cell T, which is similar, except that instead of giving references to the inner value, the value is copied in and out of the cell T. There's also mutex T, which also offers interior mutability that's safe to use across threads. We'll discuss, it, we'll discuss its use in chapter 16, next chapter. Check out the standard library docs for more details on the differences between these types. Reference cycles can leak memory. Rust memory safety guarantee makes it difficult, but not impossible to accidentally create memory that is never cleaned up, known as a memory leak. Preventing memory leaks entirely is not one of Rust's guarantees in the same way that disallowing data races at compile time is. Meaning, memory leaks are memory safe in Rust. We can see that Rust allows memory leaks by using RCT and RefCellT. It's possible to create references where items refer to each other in a cycle. This creates memory leaks because the reference count of each item in the cycle will never reach zero and the values will never be dropped. Um, okay, so basically it's possible using that that we don't, we don't really drop the stuff when we want to. Right, because like we, if it's just it's keeping the memory alive until it um, until everything is removed uh, from its internal counter. So either its internal counter gets off, which hopefully doesn't happen. That would be a bug in their code, or a bug in our code. We take we take like a borrow out of it. We borrow mute or we borrow just borrow, and then forget that we've borrowed it in a place that will keep it alive forever. Creating a reference cycle. Let's look at how a reference cycle might happen and how to prevent it, starting with the definition of the list enum and a tail method in listing 1525. Um, okay, so we have our standard list. Uh, and we implement the list. We have this tail takes a reference to self and is ret current return an option with of a, re a reference to ref cell RC list so basically the item uh, we match on the reference to self um, if it's a cons we don't really care ref item basically return some item or if it's nil, we return none. We're using another variation of the list definition in 15.5. The second element in the cons variant is now ref cell RC list, meaning that instead of having the ability to modify the I32 value as we did in listing 15.24, we want to modify which list value a cons variant is pointing to. We're also adding a tail method to make it convenient for us to access the second item if we have a cons variant. 
In listing 1526, we're adding a main function that uses the definitions in listing 1525. This code creates a list in A and a list in B that points to the list in A. Then it modifies the list in A to point to B, creating a reference cycle. Oh. It's like very hard for me to see that that's what they're doing. But it's like they're pointing at each other, which, yeah, that's, that's going to be a problem. Um, doo -doo -doo. There are print line statements along the way to show what the reference counts are at various points in this process. Oh, is this where they actually point towards each other? So let a equals rc new cons. This is this is um interesting. I'm used to the text explaining, like when they're going through explaining what the code is doing. That is after they've shown the code, and this felt like it was before. Um, but I I may be just sort of like thinking about it wrong too. All right, so let a equals rc new. So we create a new rc um, cons five ref cell. Uh, print line a initial rc count and we get the strong count a next item so a dot tail and then we saw that a dot tail is basically grabbing grabbing the end but b equals rc new cons 10 so that's the second one uh, we now have a strong count after b creation and we reference A here, so it should be two now. B initial RC count. This should be one because we haven't gotten we haven't gotten B yet. B next item, and we just you know get the next item there. If let some link some link so if let some link equals a dot tail so if we've got the end reference to the borrow mute equals rc clone b so like if we reach the end then we're going to add in b brc count arc uncomment the next line is c that we have a cycle so we'll overflow the stack print line a dot next item a dot tail so is it because like it's just it's essentially a recursive list now it just moves it just goes around forever a dot tail cannot reach the end because the end now points to the beginning we create an rc list instance holding a list value in the variable a with an initial list of five nil we then create an rc list instance holding another list value in the variable t that contains the value 10 and points to the list in A. We modify A so it points to B instead of nil, creating a cycle. We do that by using the tail method to get a reference to the ref cell RC list in A, which we then put in the variable link. Then we use the borrow mute method on a ref cell RC list to change the value inside from an RC list that holds a nil value the RC list in B. This is like really hard to keep all of this in my mind. I almost like, I wish I had like a whiteboard down here so I can, I whiteboard out everything that's going on in memory um, and make it like easier for me to like wrap my head and get a mental model about what's really going on. When we run this code, keeping that last print line commented out for the moment, we'll get this output. So uh, RC count is one, Next item is some ref cell value nil. RC count after B is two. Um, B initial RC count is one. B next item. So we're like we're building essentially the equivalent like a linked list here. B RC count after changing A equals two. A equals two. The reference count of the RC list instances in both A and B are two after we change the list in A to point to B. After the end of main, Rust will try to drop B first, which will decrease the count in each of the RC list instances in A and B by one. However, because A is still referencing the RC list that was in B, that RC list has a count of one rather than zero, 
so the memory the RC list has on the heap won't be dropped. The memory will just sit there with a count of 1 forever. To visualize this reference cycle, we've created a diagram in figure 15.4. Right, because like they're pointing towards each other. They'll never go out of, out of memory. If you uncomment the last print line and run the program, Rust will try to print this cycle with an A pointing to B, pointing to A, and so forth, until it overflows the stack. In this case, right after we create the reference cycle, the program ends. The consequences of this cycle aren't very dire. However, if a more complex program allocated lots of memory in a cycle and held on to it for a long time, the program would use more memory than it needed and might overwhelm the system, causing it to run out of available memory. Creating reference cycles is not easily done, but not impossible either. If you have refcell-t values that contain RCT, values or similar nested combination of types, with interior mutability and references counting, you must ensure that you don't create cycles. You can't rely on Rust to catch them. Creating a reference cycle would be a logic bug in your program that you should use um, a logic bug in your program that you should use automated tests, code reviews, and other software development practices to minimize. Another solution for avoiding reference cycles is reorganizing your data structures so that some references express ownership and some references don't. As a result, you can have cycles made up of some ownership relationships and some non-ownership relationships, and only the ownership relationships affect whether or not a value can be dropped. In listing 1525, we always want cons variants to own their list, so reorganizing the data structure isn't possible. Let's look at an example using graphs made up of parent nodes and child nodes to see where, when non-ownership relationships are an appropriate way to prevent reference cycles. So far, um, or rather, pre uh, preventing reference cycles turning an RCT into a weak T. So far, we've demonstrated that calling RC clone increases the strong count of an RCT instance. And an RCT instance is only cleaned up if its strong count is zero. You can also create a weak reference to the value with an RCT instance by calling RC downgrade and passing a reference to the RCT. When, when you call RC downgrade, you get a smart pointer of type weak T instead of increasing the strong count or rather, instead of uh, increasing the strong count in the RCT instance by one, calling RC downgrade increases the weak count by one. The RCT type uses weak count to keep track of how many weak T references exist, similar to strong count. The difference is the weak count doesn't need to be zero for RCT instance to be cleaned up. Strong references are how you can share ownership of a RCT instance. Weak references don't express an ownership relationship. They won't cause a reference cycle because any cycle involving some weak references will be broken once the strong reference count of values involved is zero. Because the value that weak T references might have been dropped to do anything with the value that a weak T is pointing to, you must make sure the value still exists. Do this by calling the upgrade method on a weak T instance which will return an option RCT. You'll get a result of sum if the RCT value has not been dropped yet, and a result of none if the RCT value has been dropped. Because upgrade returns an option T, Rust will ensure that the sum case and the none case are handled, and there won't be an invalid pointer. As an example, rather than using a list whose items only ab whose items know only about the next item, we'll create a tree whose items know about their children, items, and their parent items. All right, so creating a tree structure. Yeah, uh, I agree, Miguel. This is a bit confusing. Um, I think, like, there's a lot of 
of theoretical stuff going on to hear about like okay we're pointing to this area in memory or pointing to this area in memory and uh then we have a count for here and when it goes out of scope sometimes like we'll care if it's a strong count we won't care at all if it's a weak count uh and you can call all these different methods on it to do these different things um and they may or may not affect when they go out of scope it is a little bit confusing um and i think like i'm i'm kind of like wondering what the what the return on on uh uh what the roi return on investment for this part of the book is right now um one of my one of my programming friends uh in rust told me that what once you reach chapter 12 everything after that project that we did is now pretty much just going to be like more theory and higher level stuff which can be you know significantly more confusing um but let's see if we can actually i think we're going to create this tree so we'll probably program that too uh to start we'll build a tree with nodes that know about their child nodes we'll create a struct named node that holds its own i32 value as well as references to its children node values so uh let's go ahead and do this ourselves All right, so we're still in chapter 15. So, uh, projects, fine, learning Rust, chapter 15. And uh, let's create cargo new. It's a binary because we have a, a main in there. And uh, what should we call this? Um, cargo new, I guess, tree. All right, so what are we doing here? Um, use standard RC, RC, use standard cell, ref cell. So we're gonna be using both RC and ref cells. So let's get those in here. Uh, what was the other one? It's uh, cell, ref cell. And then uh, we're going to create a struct node that holds a value of i32 and children, which is uh, ref cell vec rc node. So it's not necessarily going to be a binary tree it might just be a normal tree okay with like lots of different children but that's okay um let's do that so struct node we need a value of i32 and children of a ref cell of a vector that holds rc node okay ah uh, let's do it so first of all we'll turn on the drive debug Is it that way? Yeah, it is. Struct, um, we'll call this a node. And we have a value, which is an i32. And then we have a children. I'm used to like when creating a, like a, t stru uh, a tree structure of using like, if I'm doing a, a left and right, like a binary tree, I might just do like left and then right. Um, I guess I haven't really thought about using a vector or a list um, to hold the children before. But I haven't really like done tree structures myself and for like real projects ever. It's always just been examples of like, oh, well, let's just create a binary tree to show an example of what that looks like. Um, so this is going to be a ref cell. Ref cell, which is an RC, is it? A, it's an RC. No, this is a vec, which is for RC, 
and its type is a node. Yeah, love that triple triple um, chevrons. Is that what they are? We want a node to own its children, and we want to share that ownership with variables so we can each we can access each node in the tree directly. To do this, we define the vec t items to be values of type rc node. We also want to modify which nodes are children of another node, so we have a ref cell t in children around the vec rc node. So want node on its children, so we use it we use the um so we can access each shell in a tree directly. So that's why they're using a vector. Uh, items to be type of RC node. RC node is because we can own them, but we don't have to worry about how big they are. We also want to modify which nodes are children of another node. So we have ref cell t in order to make to like take mutable borrows out of it. That's that's why we're using ref cell t also. I kind of wonder like, can we use it in both places like ref cell vec and ref cell node? Um, in here, is it like best practice to do this? My guess uh, it probably is, uh, because RC cannot allow you to take it out um, mutably. Next, we'll use our struct definition and create one node instance named leaf with the value 3 and no children, and another instance named branch with the value 5 and leaf as one of its children, as shown in listing 1527. Um, okay, so function main let leaf equals an rc new, pass it in node. Or no, then create a new node, value three, uh, children of ref cell new. So interesting. They're not they're not following the um, the new the new pattern that we've been seeing with um, with structs. We don't implement new ourselves. So that leaf equals rc, and then we pass it a new node, value three, and its children are a ref cell cell new vec of empty. So uh, what do we call this again? That leaf. That leaf equals, and so it's going to be a new RC. So RC new, and the value is going to be uh, this entire node here, because it just it feels interesting that the leaf itself is an RC too. Like, I get. I guess we need to do that. Um, but we're gonna put in node, and here our value is gonna be a three, and children is going to be a ref cell of an empty vector. Okay, then we create a branch with an RC new, also another node. It has its own value five, but the children is ref cell new, a vector where the first item in the vector is RC clone the leaf. A reference to the leaf. RC clone a reference to the leaf. Let branch equals, so it's going to be an RC, new again. Um, it's going to be another node. And its value is going to be 5 this time. And its children are also going to be a ref cell. Like, I almost feel that, oh, okay, I'm thinking about it upside down. In a tree, in a tree structure, uh, the leaves are at the very bottom. 
So if we take a look at um, at this GitHub icon right here as our as our tree, uh, this down here at the bottom, we're right next to the two, that's the leaf. And so the reason why we have to cr we create it first, even though it comes at the very bottom of the tree, is because it is um, uh, it has to be referenced here. So new value, and this is going to be a vector. Uh, but we have a leaf. Oh, and it's RC clone leaf, of course. Yeah, okay. That wasn't as part of the uh the uh, the clone. It all it's throwing me off that the clone isn't part of the autocomplete here that VS Code has. Okay, so now we have branch, which is not used, but it's like everything's super happy with it. Uh, we clone the RC node in leaf and store that in branch, meaning the node in leaf now has two owners, leaf and branch. We can get from branch to leaf through the branch.children, but there's no way to get from leaf to branch. The reason is that leaf has no reference to branch and doesn't know they're related. We want leaf to know that branch is its parent, We'll do that next. I mean, it's not always necessary to have uh, children understand and know about their parents. Adding a reference from a child to its parent. To make the child node aware of its parent, we need to add a parent field to our node struct definition. The trouble is in deciding what type of parent should be. We know it can't contain an RCT because that would create a reference cycle with leaf.parent pointing to branch and branch.children pointing to leaf, which would cause their strong count values to never be zero. Thinking about the relationships another way, a parent node should own its children. If a parent node is dropped, its children node should be dropped as well. However, a child should not own its parent. If we drop a child node, the parent should still exist. This is a case for weak references. So instead of RCT, we'll make the type of parent use weak T, specifically a ref cell weak node. Uh, now our code struct definition looks like this. So uh, user standard RC, RC and weak. So we need to do that. I'm just gonna go ahead and use, um, is it, um, it's curly brackets. RC weak. Uh, then in our struct node, we have um, a parent with it, which is ref cell weak node, as opposed to ref cell vec. Parent is ref cell. Is it? Okay, it's here, and we just do weak, and then this is a node. That. All right, so then when we create these, a leaf, for example, needs to know about the parent. But here's a problem. The leaf can't know about its parent because it doesn't exist yet. The branch is created down here, so I'm curious about what they're going to do about that. A node will be able to refer to its parent node but doesn't own its parent. In listing 1528, we update main to use this new definition so the leaf node will always will have a way to refer to its parent branch. So let leaf equals rc new node, value is three, parent is ref cell new weak new. So basically it's empty for right now. Uh, so this is ref cell new weak new interesting. And that will fix up leaf. Print line parent leaf equals leaf dot parent dot borrow dot upgrade. Uh, we upgrade it so that way we can actually get the value and, and get it out. That's 
Uh, it feels it feels a little bit interesting doing this. Um, and then we have our branch, and its parent is also just an empty um, new week. So ref cell new, and this is a week new. And then we take out, okay, leaf.parent.borrow.mute, rc downgrade branch. We downgrade that because the rc down, the branch is a strong, and we need to make sure it's weak when we hand it into here. Okay, so we have a destructure or a de dereference leaf then we can get the parent off of it and then we borrow the parent mutably so that way we can uh we can set that so um let's let's first do that that uh, print line so print line what are we looking at leaf parent and then look at the leaf pot parent so leaf parent So it's going to be leaf dot parent uh, dot. We need to borrow it now. If I don't, if I don't upgrade it, what what happens? Do we get some kind of error? Leaf parent weak. Um, and so if I do the dot upgrade, leaf parent none. So we got just like the, the weak type essentially, uh, but when we upgrade it, that gives us the actual value. Well, it's not really a value, it's an option. It's an option. So there is nothing in it yet, which is okay. It'll be a sum when it uh, when we eventually can can grab that. It's so like then we can do essentially an unwrap, which would in this case crash because it's a none. All right. Um. And then, then we're doing the exact same thing again, leaf parent borrow upgrade. So running this exact same code again, right down here. So this way we can see, okay, after we do this next command, which we're gonna say, okay, leaf, we're setting on leaf, right? Leaf parent borrow mute. So leaf.parent dot borrow mute that doesn't like it at all did I like script something else Hold up. Yeah, everything is working here um so maybe I have to dereference from the beginning leaf dot parent Dot. Oh, now there's no autocomplete anymore. Borrow mute. And set this equal to the branch. Is it is it just branch dot? What if I just do that? Mismatch types expected struct standard RC weak found it found struct standard RC RC. Um, let's see if it tells me what it thinks that I should do. Nope, so it doesn't have any uh, any suggestion for it, but I think, what, it, what do they say? It's like downgrade, so dot downgrade. Nope, 
No method named downgrade. Okay, fine. Oh, it's RC downgrade. Then we hand it, hand it a reference to branch. So this is part of RC downgrade. We hand it a reference to branch. And that will downgrade the branch and the result of that to leaf parent borrow mute. So now we can see what we get. So leaf parent none, leaf parent son, sum, and then that's a, so the parent is a node with a value of five and a children of ref cell, which is a value of node, value of three, children of ref cell, value of absolutely nothing, um, parent of ref cell, value of, okay, that, it's cool. It's just really hard to like fully wrap my head around what, what is going on here. But I'm glad we have this code down so we can like potentially analyze it if I ever feel like creating a tree. Creating the leaf node looks similar to how creating the leaf node looked in listing 1527, with the exception of the parent field. The leaf starts out without a parent, so we create a new empty weak node reference instance. At this point, when we try to get a reference to the parent of leaf by using the upgrade method, we get a none value. We see this in the output from the first print line statement, leaf parent equals none. When we create the branch code, it will also have a new weak node reference in a parent field. Because branch doesn't have a parent node, we still have leaf as one of the children of branch. Once we have the node instance in branch, we can modify leaf to give it a weak node, reference to its parent. We use the borrow mute method on the ref cell weak node in the parent field of leaf, and then we use the RC downgrade function to create a weak node reference to branch from RC node in branch. So I guess like the, the biggest thing that we're doing here, like I, I think that the biggest takeaway for it is if we want to create two, um, two data structures that are embedded inside of each other, but we can't, we have to create them separately first and then attach them to each other later. We're, we may need a ref cell in order to mutably borrow when normally it's not mutable. Like that, that's like the thing that I'm taking away from this. When we print the parent of leaf again, this time we'll see a sum variant holding branch. Now leaf can access as parent. When we print leaf, we also avoid the cycle that eventually ended in a stack overflow like we had in listing 1526. The weak node references are printed as weak. The lack of infinite output indicates that this code didn't create a reference cycle. We can also tell this by looking at the values we get from calling RC strong count and RC weak count. Visualizing changes to strong count and weak count. Let's look at how the strong count and weak count values of the RC node instances change by creating a new inner scope and moving the creation of branch into that scope. By doing so, we can see what happens when branch is created and then dropped when it goes out of scope. The modifications are shown in listing 1529. So let's take a look at what they did here. Nothing new here. We have a print line, um, leaf strong, weak, RC strong count, RC weak count, and pass it to leaf. Then we have a block here. Uh, this is where we create the branch. Leaf parent borrow mu, downgrade branch, so then this is all the, the same stuff. We have our print lines for like a leaf count, strong and weak. Then this, uh, this closes. So it goes out of, all this stuff goes out of scope. The branch goes out of scope. Leaf parents, borrow upgrade, print line, okay. After leaf is created, its RC node has a strong count of one and a weak count of zero. In the inner scope, we create branch and associate it with leaf 
at which point when we create the counts, the RC node and branch will have a strong count of one and a weak count of one for leaf.parent pointing to branch with a weak node. When we print the counts in leaf, we will see it have a strong count of two because branch now has a clone of the RC node of leaf stored in the branch.children, but we still have a weak count of zero. When the inner scope ends, branch goes out of scope and the strong counts of the RC node decreases to zero, so its node is dropped. The weak count of one from leaf.parent has no bearing on whether or not the node is dropped, so we don't get any memory leaks. If we try to access the parent of leaf after the end of the scope, we'll get a none again. At the end of the program, the RC node in leaf has a strong count of one and a weak count of zero because the variable leaf is now the only reference to the RC node again. All of the logic that manages the counts and value dropping is built into the RCT and weak T and their implementations of the drop trait. By specifying that the relationship from a child to its parent should be a weak T, reference in a definition of node, you're able to have parent nodes point to child nodes and vice versa without creating a reference cycle and memory leaks. So like, I feel that a huge amount of this, a huge part is, is like in these trees and data structures, which traditionally, when we're writing business logic, um, business applications, we normally don't have to write these kind of data structures because there's all these standard libraries that implement them for that. And looking at the crates IO, there are tons of implementations already for us to use uh, for t tree data structures, linked lists, or anything else. So I don't really see much reason why we may have to use those ourselves in our programs. Um, unless we wanted to submit bug fixes or changes to these other libraries, then we'd have to like really understand and know how they work so that we can use them. Um, now, of course, if I'm wrong, please let me know so I can uh, correct myself and, and be right. Uh, summary. This chapter covered how to use smart pointers to make different guarantees and trade-offs than those Rust makes by default with regular references. The box T type has a known size and points to data allocated on the heap. The RC T type uh, keeps track of the number of references to data on the heap. The data can have multiple owners. The ref cell T type with its interior mutability gives us a type that we can use when we need an immutable type but we need to change an inner value of that type. It also enforces the borrowing rules at runtime instead of at compile time. Also discussed were the deref and drop traits, which enable a lot of the functionality of smart pointers. We explored reference cycles that can cause memory leaks and how to prevent them using weak T. If this chapter has piqued your interest and you want to implement your own smart pointers, check out the Rustonomicon for more useful information. Next, we'll talk about concurrency in Rust. You'll even learn about a few new smart pointers. Uh, specifically that mutex one, right? I think that's what they, they referenced heavily. Uh, well, no, they referenced. They uh, implied heavily is what we're going to use for, uh, uh, for threading. Um, yeah, from a high-level perspective, I get what they're trying to teach show do, but this chapter... <laughs> Yeah, this chat, like this chat, like everything was like, yeah, we're cruising, cruising, cruising. All right, uh, we're going uphill now pretty fast. Um, I think a lot of it is just going to be like, okay, I need to know, I need to be aware that there is a ref cell type, that there is an RC type, that there is a box type. I need to be aware of in general what they do. So that way, if I need it, I know to go look for it. I don't need to memorize, I believe, how, everything, how to use it. Um, I just need to know that it's there for me. But at 7.55, we finished chapter 15. That took like half a week to do. Uh, I believe we're, we're moving on to chapter 16 next, concurrency, which is uh, gonna be pretty awesome because that means we're getting into, um, we're getting to threading and working with uh with potentially more interesting like uh uh apis and uh and doing some more real world stuff 
So let's first do down. And let's open up our readme. Okay, so currently at, we are now gonna be currently at Fearless Concurrency. Which I am super looking forward to tomorrow. <laughs> All right, so let's save that. Let's push these on up. So it is finished. Um, finished smart pointers with ref, cell, and RC. And that's pushing on up to GitHub. So I'm going to put a link to where all of this is in the chat. OK, so. Um, we have uh, we have links to all the code that I just created, including that tree. It's now going to be here in chapter fifteen. Uh, we have um, we have a few other other interesting tidbits throughout here. Um, we also have this wiki that uh, when we start beginning, you know, creating new stuff, we'll add into that. Uh, going through the book, I'm not adding to the wiki. It's more of like when I actually program real things. That's mainly what I'm going to add in. It's like, okay, how do I do this again? Let me add it in there for a reference. Then um, I just sort of forgot what I was what I was saying, but uh, basically I'm doing these streams where I'm going through the book every single weekday morning um, at 7 a.m. Mountain Time. Tomorrow will not be an extent uh, exception. I'll be here going through Chapter 16. We're coming close, like we're getting closer and closer to the end. When we're finished with the book, it's a uh, it doesn't mean we're done with rest. It just means that now we're going to start building thing, whatever things that I can think of uh, just for more practice, but also hopefully things that I can use in uh, my day to day life. I have some ideas already, but uh, if any of you have ideas of what you'd like to see me build or if you want to build alongside um, aside me and, you know, continue to work on rest as well, that would be super awesome. We should uh, we should get some kind of coding group going. Uh, with that, I'm going to go and get ready for the rest of my day, and I hope that you all have a great rest of your day. If you would like to get notifications of these uh, videos, please follow me here on uh, Twitch or YouTube and Twitter. And with that, I'm going to shut off the stream. Uh, have a great day, and I'll see you tomorrow morning.